we have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. I'm your host, Dr. J. Andy Elias, and we'll be taking you on an amazing journey today. We have Stephen Bassett joining us in a little bit. He's going to be talking about the truth embargo and the citizens hearing that's coming up soon everybody i think we got mr bassett online are you there mr bassett yes i am excellent you know we've had everybody here we're talking about you know open open contact finally coming and mr kiernan was speaking at the museum exhibit of the opening with stanton friedman i think all these coming together with the key event that you have the citizens hearing to, is going to finally end this truth embargo. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, look, a lot is happening this year. There's a lot going on. It's so much that you just get pieces uh, and uh, some information here and there from different people. But the truth embargo is near its end. It's been you know, hanging on by a thread, frankly, for a number of years. The truth embargo, of course, is the policy of the U.S. government and its allies to not acknowledge this extraterrestrial present, to pretend it's not here, to deny it, um, say as little as possible, even nothing. When cornered, again, come up with flat statements of denial. This policy has now been in place for 65 years. Um, so uh, we think it's time for this policy to end, and it's time for the people to know the truth. Uh, a rather important piece of information, namely they're not alone in the universe. Okay, good. Um, what will end it? What will change this policy? Governments usually don't give up their policies, particularly when they've held them for a long time easily. They, 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 keep, they hang on as a matter of pride, as a matter of public relations, you name it. Uh, and they've been really very resistant. But uh, the, it's catching up with them. Public awareness is nearly 100% worldwide. 50% of the American people, in fact, all of the developed nations, uh, believe that this phenomenon is extraterrestrial. 85% believe their governments are not lying about They're lying to them. Uh, oh, probably based on some polling, recent polling, 50% of all of the people in the world uh, believe this phenomenon is uh, extraterrestrial. So how long can you maintain this this illusion, this, this uh, the rather strange um, misrepresentation. So, is this the year? Very likely. I think uh, the prospects look good. I'm getting, I'm getting comments that insiders inside government are making moves themselves. That there's kind of a timeline underway, a little bit slow, perhaps, but nevertheless underway. Uh, and we have, of course, our contribution to the process, the disclosure process, and that's the citizen hearing which is scheduled for April 29 to May 3. This citizen's hearing is going to be broadcast on the web for the whole world to see. Can you tell everybody where they can see it? Yeah, the website is citizenhearing.org, and at citizenhearing.org you can easily find the webcast link. We're going to webcast it in English and Spanish, which covers you know, about 1.7 billion people. Uh, our plan is to then archive it in uh, Mandarin Chinese, Arabic, Japanese, and uh, Hindi so that in archive, people will be able to go and watch the entire hearing, all 30 hours of testimony and questions and answers for $3.80. I mean, it's $3.80 to watch it live for a whole week and $3.80 to go to the archive. So we're trying to make it as accessible as possible to everybody. Um, and this is part of the, the power of this event. Uh, the citizen hearing is more than just a press conference, much, much more. It's not two hours in front of some media. It's 30 hours over five days with media coverage before, during, and after. And it's being webcast. Whether or not television gets in there, C-SPAN, whatever, we will be webcasting it. Uh, more importantly, it's the number of witnesses is 40. 40, 41 witnesses will be presenting testimony. And then, of course, there's the fact that the hearing committee is made up not of just anybody, but former members of the United States Congress and Senate, House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, the, between these six committee members is 80 years of tenure in the uh, House of Representatives, the U.S. Congress, and the Senate. This has never been done before. 
It's unprecedented. Uh, furthermore, we're filming the entire thing, so we'll have an extensive record, and we're going to make a documentary about it called Truth Embargo. You know, Stephen, with this truth embargo and all the testimony from this kind of caliber of eyewitness, mm -hmm. you know, it seems quite historic. It would hold up in any criminal law, obviously. What about the higher government? Do you think, you know, people in charge are going to be keeping a close eye on this and feel threatened that the truth may be untold and maybe feel like, you know, we might be ready for disclosure? Well, we, we're pretty confident that a significant percentage of people inside government right now are probably in favor of the truth, ending the truth embargo. We've got plenty of allies inside, um, and that only grows. I'm sure the government is paying attention. I know the government is paying attention to this. I mean, we're holding it two blocks from the White House and 14 blocks from the U.S. Capitol. Uh, there's already been some substantial covers. There's going to be a lot more. So, yeah, they're fully aware of it. Do they feel threatened by it? I, you know, I, I, I think ultimately they know the truth embargo is going to end. So I suppose to the extent that it might in, 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 in advance the pace of, of, of that, I suppose that maybe they would prefer to have a little more time. But the idea that, like, the truth embargo is going to be around a long time and this is going to suddenly change that, uh, no. So we, we think probably it's going to build more allies in government uh, and, and help the process rather than create any re too much resistance. Um, that's, that's my sense right now. So, again, we're getting very quick feedback, even from insiders. We're getting some feedback indirect from insiders that are basically sort of endorsing the idea. As far as, um, you know, reports being made by... FAA, you know, pilots, they really can't report to the FAA anymore. They made a new law, I think, back in 2010 that they were uh, not to take any more reports or not to receive any in the FAA, but they were redirected the pilots to um, Bigelow Aerospace, and they would take the report. Why do you think the government wanted to bow out of, uh, you know, taking these reports from the pilots, and you know, what do you think was behind that whole situation where they just diverted uh, that, well, that, that was actually a very short episode. Um, the there's a, there's a the, the complex policy here is that um, the, the government understood that pilots uh, are fairly trained people, uh, particularly airline pilots, obviously military pilots, and so when they see these things and they do and they talk about it, that's a problem for the truth embargo. So, as one of the many, many things they had to do to maintain this truth embargo as long as they have, is they had to quiet the pilots. And so, essentially, the military told them, you know, you don't talk about this. And that's pretty pretty strong. I mean, if you're, if you're serving in the military, there's a whole lot of reasons why you, you're, you can't violate your orders. Uh, as far as the civilian pilots, well, naturally, they want their job. So, they were told they, they could, shouldn't talk about it. So, they, they shut the pilots up. Of course, then what happened is that uh, people started going to researchers, the most prominent one being a NASA scientist by the name of Richard Haynes, who started collecting these pilot reports in a database, which I know is at least 3,500 now, many anonymous, uh, for obvious reasons. And that, is one of the, that database of pilot reports is one of the most important pieces of evidence in the world. Because we're talking about pilots seeing 30-foot, 40-foot discs off their wingtips. Kind of unambiguous, you know. I wouldn't call that a UFO. I would call that a 40-foot disc. It's definitely not a flock of geese or a frisbee. So, again, these kinds of things, uh, they, they wanted to suppress that. And there was an episode a while back when, uh, as part of Robert Bigelow's engagement of this issue, and he is, to his credit, put a lot of money behind research in this field, though he's kind of withdrawn right at the moment. They tried to sort of set up a thing where the, the sightings would be reported to Bigelow's organization. Well, that, that fell apart very quickly uh, for a number of reasons. I think the intentions might have been good, but nevertheless, uh, not acceptable that a private organization would have some sort of exclusive arrangement. Why would they do that? Well, in general, they, they, they shut Blue Book down in 1969. Because, look, if you don't have to answer questions, then you don't have to talk about something. Right? The last thing they want to do is ask questions, have to respond to anybody about it, this. They want us all to just go away. 
pretend it's, it's not there. They want the newspapers not to cover it, the Congress not to investigate it. They just want us to not deal with it. And, and unfortunately, they've done this in other areas. The, the, the evidence that they're going to be presenting has been known. Most of it's been known for some time. Uh, the problem is we, not do we have the evidence or is the evidence powerful enough? We, it's been more than adequate for decades. It's that there's a truth embargo which says that whatever you have, we don't, we don't want to hear it. You know, if you're a pilot, you see a disc, we don't want to know about it. If you had a major sighting, we don't know about that either. If you saw something uh, or if you worked on a program, don't talk about it, etc. I mean, it's, it's just the game. just goes on and on. Uh, but what, what is different about this citizen hearing is, is that we, we just don't have uh, a few witnesses. We have researchers and witnesses. In other words, we've got researchers there that represent, boy, probably a couple hundred years of, of, of direct research into this phenomenon, and then we've got military agency political witnesses that, that have had direct uh, engagement of contacts, I mean, with events and evidence, uh, also presenting together. Off, most of these press conferences that have been held in the last few years have generally been just witness, military agency witnesses saying, well, I saw this, I did this. We're adding the researchers into the mix so they can provide much more in-depth background to the larger picture. So this is just going to give it more heft. That's why it takes five days. Because right? we've got 40 witnesses. Many of them are going to testify more than once. We're probably going to have, in that sense, 60 to 70 witnesses that are going to be in panel right before these former members of Congress. Uh, two of the most important panels will be the Roswell panel and the uh, nuclear tampering panel. Uh, we have, with respect to the nuclear tampering issue, we have um, uh, Robert Salas, uh, Maelstrom Air Force Base case, Minot case, and then, of course, we have others related to that issue. David Scott, David uh, Shen Shendley, uh, Bruce Lenstermacher, uh, Richard Dolan will be talking about uh, other cases. Uh, that's a, that's, that's going to go on for three hours. That's a long, long session and uh, one of the most important stories out there. Uh, they gave a press conference on this a number of several years ago that should have been major news. But of course, the truth embargo, the press goes well. You know, we we're not really allowed to go further with that. But thank you so much. Well, we're going to put it under the nose again. Uh, the Roswell panel is going to have uh, wow. Don Schmidt, Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, Jesse Marcel Jr., Jesse's children, Jesse Marcel the third, and Denise Marcel are going to testify next to him. Edgar Mitchell will comment by Skype. That's going to be a double session for three hours. You know, um, this gives you a sense of the, of, the, of the testimony. Mr. Bassett, you have, I see the witness list. I mean, it is enormous. You have the Roswell panel. Then you have the panel from uh, the people that were involved in the 1980 Rendlesham Forest. And I think this is finally going to blow things out of the water. These are top people, top witnesses. Like you said, Jesse Marcel Jr., he actually handled some of the debris, one of the last remaining people to do right. so. And he'll testify that his father was telling the truth, and his kids will testify their grandfather was telling the truth, and they'll all tell us, maybe talk a little bit about the effect it, it's had on their family to be you know, involved in something like that, and then the government denies everything you say. And, and, and you're, you know, you're good Americans, and uh, obviously Jesse Marcel uh, Sr. was an officer with a security clearance. Jesse Marcel Jr. has served in Iraq and retired from the Air National Guard, I believe, as a colonel. And these are good people who have had good lives, and yet the government says they're liars. Uh, this has this has an impact on the family. We talk a little bit about that. Uh, we've got people. We have uh, uh, we have uh, try to get some representation. I think we have ten countries represented overall. Probably the leading UFO researcher in uh, I say UFO extraterrestrial phenomena researcher is what it is. In Italy, Roberto Panati will be there. Uh, here is a, fr uh, a rare instance. The leading ET researcher in the People's Republic of China, Dr. Sun Shili, will be there testifying. Um, we have Colonel Richard French, who will be talking about Roswell. He's a recent witness. Um, uh, and of course, we have researchers like Stan Freeman and Grant Cameron, Richard Dolan. We have uh, three, uh, th two individuals from the Bentwaters case. Uh, and we also have Nick Pope talking about the Bentwaters Rendlesham case. Uh, again, this is a lot of material. And then we have a huge South American panel that's going to go on for three hours because of so much going in South America. 
So we have A.J. Gavard representing Brazil, Dr. Anthony Choi representing Peru. We have Ariel Sanchez representing Uruguay, and, and Alejandro uh, Chianetti representing Argentina, talking about what's going on there. Antonio Neyes, Chile, and then Oscar Santa Maria. We're hoping to get someone from Mexico. We're still working on that. There's, uh, what, 700 million people down there, and they're having all kinds of engagement with the issue, not to mention a lot of military coming forward. And again, this is all about something that the White House, just 18 months ago, in a written statement issued through the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which you can go on the White House website and find right now, that there's no evidence at all. None of this is true. There's no evidence. None of this is evidence at all of an extraterrestrial presence. And there's no evidence that the government has ever hidden anything. I mean, th this is a remarkable statement. It's more of a bald-faced lie than anything ever Bill Clinton ever said about Monica Lewinsky. It's an extraordinary, complete, indefensible untruth that is now their policy in writing, for better or for worse. And, it, and when they put it in writing as a response to the uh, Paradigm Research Group's disclosure petition of September 22nd, 2011, it was the first time the White House ever put anything in writing, which, which is notable. Because you don't want to ever do that. Remember, you don't want to answer questions. You don't want to be asked questions. You don't want to put anything in writing. You want this to just go away. And so when they, when they gave that response, something in me said, you know, they can't possibly respond favorably to that petition by saying, well, we'll consider it. It's an issue worth whatever. They could not do that. So what they did was issue a completely indefensible false response knowing that we would tear it to pieces. It was almost like the White House was saying, this is the best we can do. Here's something you can rip to pieces. Rip it to pieces, and maybe the media will go, wow, you know, that's some pretty big news. The White House has lied about the most important issue in the world today. Maybe we ought to put a reporter on that. Maybe ask a few tough questions. So I'll, I'll wonder, unless, I'm, unless I finally learn, for, for sure, if, not, if that was not an intentional assistance provided to the disclosure movement by the White House by putting out such a completely indefensible blanket statement like that, whereas they could have written some wishy-washy thing that they could have easily backed out of or, or uh, you know, rationalized. They didn't do that. Absolute brute statement. No evidence exists. None of the material, none of the millions of sightings, none of the 5,000 books, none of the witnesses coming forward, none of the documents have been gotten from government, none of the tens of thousands of documents released by over a dozen countries in the last 10 years. None of that is evidence for an extraterrestrial presence. What an unbelievable statement. It makes the government statement about, uh, uh, you know, uh, not too long ago about nuclear weapons in Iraq pale in its boldness, right? You know, Mr. Bassett, you actually beat me to the question I was going to ask you. But before I do that, I got to make a statement. All these mm -hmm. witnesses are true top witnesses. You got Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon. And for the public... With because of the media spin and the ridicule people receive on this UFO topic, are taking down this man who is a national hero. But let me go back to the petition that you said, mm -hmm. 2011. At the time, it was 5,000 signatures. You got 12,000, right? Right, which they got our response, which is why we were able to get a response, because that was the rule at the time. Yeah, and then they changed it to a 25,000. This last petition, they changed it to 100,000 after we started getting yeah. the word out. You know, and when you, when you, after that happened, and I heard a lecture from you at the Conscious Life Expo in 2012, and you said something amazing. You brought up during the Kennedy administration how so many people in the media knew the secrets that were going on. But because Kennedy did not lie to the public and to, to the media, they let it go. But yet, when Clinton came on board and he lied straight to the public and to all the media and they knew he was lying, they attacked him. And I... Just like you said in your lecture last year, I truly hope that the media will finally pick up on this of being lied to. Well, it is certainly an issue. I mean, of course, the, the world has changed since since Kennedy. Yeah, and obviously Kennedy didn't lie about his affairs. Uh, he, he was not asked. It was like an understanding. we pretty well. That changed, and it became a lot more difficult for any president to act like uh, Jack Kennedy. And fortunately for Bill Clinton, he really wanted to act like Jack Kennedy. He, he was his hero. Um, and and but when he stepped out on uh, on, a, on the podium that time and said he had not had sex with that woman. Uh, he really crossed the line uh, 
and help to ensure that the media frenzy would 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 essentially bring it all out. Um, of course, Nixon lied straight face to the press too, and they knew he was lying, and, and they brought him down. Um, this is what's the truth embargo has been maintained by just avoiding as much as possible ever having to lie straight face to the press, dodging, weaving, not responding. Um, and of course, you know, building it up over so many decades that the press just sort of got fully enculturated into this and hypnotized, you might say. And so they, they, they got away with it, but it, it's getting harder and harder. And uh, for whatever reason, either by intention or because they didn't see it coming when they created that petition program, We the People, at the White House website, they got put in a position where they, they either had to say, we don't want to respond to that petition, which would have been very, very uh telling or they had to give a some sort of a semi-positive response which would have been pretty interesting for them and or a complete denial and they chose the complete denial so the the strategy of course was to get that all along now in the last 18 months we certainly attacked that position in various ways with five more by the way five more petitions that went to the White House website and stayed up there for 30 days, not longer, because we could never get the 25 and eventually 100,000 signatures. But the, the citizen hearing is designed specifically to provide the, the – it's the other shoe dropping here. The first shoe was the disclosure petition and the White House response. Eighteen months later, we dropped the second shoe. We're in – for five days, we're going to dump 30 hours of the evidence the White House claims doesn't exist, and we're hoping a couple of, re- of, of editors and publishers will go, okay, that's it, that's enough, and they're going to go Watergate, Iran Gate, Benghazi Gate, Travel Gate, Pork Belly Gate, Trooper Gate, Pick a Gate, they're going to go gate on this issue, and once they do that, once they start asking Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Webster Hubble and John Podesta and Bill Richardson and Al Gore and the current Secretary of State, the current head of the CIA, the obvious questions, it's over. It's done. The truth embargo will not last two weeks. You know, you have so many of these top people that have such extraordinary evidence, extraordinary testimony of what they witnessed, and yet people don't take it seriously. And the thing is, is just like Stan Friedman says, you know, it's, it's the noisy negatives. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind is already made up. All it takes is a little research into the facts to realize not only is there something to this, there is really something to this. Well, of course. And that's been known for a long time. Look, let me, let me tell you, the media know this is true. I mean, there's a huge number of people in the media that know this is true. So and 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 uh, they write thousands of stories about it. I mean, you go to Paradigm Research Group website, check out the media archive. I mean, there's six, seven thousand stories there, articles. They just write articles, though. They just it's like whatever happened, write it up. This this uh, statement, that statement, this press conference, write it up. No no investigation. In other words, it's like it's like Woodward and Bernstein not investigating Watergate, just writing what the administration was doing on a daily basis, but never actually going and doing any quote real investigation. They, they, they've stayed out of the investigation mode because they know if they go there, they end the truth embargo, and it's sort of understood you don't do that. But the, the point is, is that the, the number of people taking it seriously grows every year. And so let's, let's, let's don't overstate the situation. The situation right now is the majority of people believe the ET issue is real. The vast majority know the government's lying. More and more media are covering the issue. It just hasn't finally broken yet. The truth embargo is just clinging there, hanging there. And, and, and it's all it's going to take is a little, little more effort, a little more force, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall. And the question is when. And the analogy is perfect to the situation in the Soviet Union. Uh, it became increasingly clear the Soviet Union was kind of hanging on by a thread, but nevertheless, it was a formidable uh, you know, totalitarian country. But the question became, when would it, when would it fall? Now, no one could say for sure, but it, did it fall? Of course it did. And when it happened, it happened very quickly. And the truth embargo will fall the same way, very quickly, almost catching you by surprise. You know, last night you were talking about something really interesting that that the government is because of everything going around and going on with all the increase in sightings and and the new generation literally believing what's happening around the world that they starting to get together and actually form a uh, maybe a disclosure type event that's going to be two three five ten thirty years from now but like you said they're not on our time 
Oh God, no! I, I think. I mean, I'm getting, I and mean, we're getting lots of feedback that there's some sort of plan going on, but their time schedule is way off. Whether it's 30 years, whether it's 10 years, whether it's three years, if it ain't three months, uh, they're in for a shock. Because the government, the U.S. government's got a big problem. Uh, it can't, it can't really control its allies anymore. It can't even take care of its own business. And you can't go to the world and say you will do everything without getting any of the benefit of being the nation that ended it. They get all the downside. They don't get the upside. Right? And so they're running out of time. And it could, it, it could be worse than that. Uh, uh, the country that, that, that ends up ending the truth embargo could be the People's Republic of China. Now, what, what are they going to do about that? I mean, they're going to they're thank the People's Republic of China. Oh, thank you for finally bringing the truth to your people. Now we can tell the truth to our people. Wow. That's going to go over great. That's going to go over really big amongst American patriots and uh, American exceptionalists and the entire, you know, everybody right of the center. And they're going to have to deal with that. And that's not good. It could be Russia. So they, they, are, they are really, really playing with their geopolitical legacy here, and I don't think they get it. And no matter how many times we stick it in front of their nose, they just try to pretend it's not there. Well, let me tell you, they had better get on their bicycle and start pedaling. And the, the problem that they face, the problem that this truth embargo is trying to solve for them by triggering the media to come after them in a big way, not to bring them down, but to finally get them out of the box they're in, is a pretty, pretty straightforward thing. What has happened over the over the sixty five years, but particularly the first uh, forty four from forty seven to ninety one of this truth embargo, is that the the the, the growing uh, intelligence complex, the huge covert world that they built, pulled the issue out from under the politicians, out from under the executive branch, the Congress, just pulled it out from under them and, and said, you know, nothing there, don't worry about it. So the oversight disappeared. The need to brief went away. It's like, hey, you got plenty to worry about. Don't worry about this. Need to know. Need to know. And so now the Congress is out of the picture. The president's not being briefed. And so they did that, and they felt very cool about it. It's going to be a lot easier to maintain this embargo now that it's pretty much just in the basement of the of the of the Pentagon or or underground in some facilities in in the, in the deep Western country. Except, guess what the problem is now. As, as, as the pressure mounts on the truth embargo, the president hasn't got the information to go before the American people. The president can't go in front of the American people and say, there's extraterrestrials here, but I can't tell you anymore because the military won't give me the evidence. I don't think so. And so the president can't act. Meanwhile, the military and the intelligence community have, a, have another problem. Though they may think so on occasion, they are not the fourth branch of government. They are the employees of the president. They serve the president. He is the commander-in-chief of all of them. And so no bird colonel in the Air Force or some middle manager in the CIA or even the director of the CIA is going to get up some morning and say, I think it's time for the American people to know they're not alone in the universe and call a press conference. It's treason just for openers. All right? It will, it will destroy the relationship between the military intelligence community and the executive branch and cause untold chaos, they can't do it. And so they can't tell us. The president can't tell us. They block themselves out. And so what has to happen? It's not that difficult. The president needs to send a representative of the executive branch. If I had to pick a candidate, John Podesta, number one on my list. They need to send that person to a meeting with a representative of the military intelligence complex management group that runs this organization, whatever the hell it's called. And they meet in private, and they come to an understanding. What does the president need from the military intelligence complex in terms of evidence so that he can go before the American people and be backed up so that the disclosure event is done properly and the American people are comfortable with what they hear? And the military intelligence community has got to get from the president and understand and explain to the president what they expect and need from the executive branch uh, to serve the interests of national security as they view it. And once that understanding has been has been reached, disclosure can happen the next day. And they're not going to wait around. It's not the kind of thing you sit on. And it's done. They hold it. They get it done. It's done. So this meeting has to take place. It's that simple. And that's the message we're sending over and over and over and over again. 
get together with the military intelligence complex, Mr. President, and get a deal done so that you can end this truth embargo first, if you're smart, the rest of the world will follow very quickly, and then we will be in the post-disclosure world, and then we can work with that. If you don't, some other nation is going to do it, and I guarantee you the United States will suffer profoundly for it, and the president who is sitting on his hands the day another nation disclosed the extraterrestrial presence will have a catastrophic political legacy. You know, you, Mr. Bassett, you mentioned something really amazing, uh, which a true point. What happens if Russia brings it? What happens if China brings this up first before the U.S. does? I was talking to Dr. Lear recently, and we were mentioning Brazil. They're mm-hmm. open in South America. Brazil does not need oil because they run on ethanol. Right. If, what if they bring it up first? We're going to look so stupid because we're covering the the world in in essence like we said you know if 30 years ago we said jump the world said how high but that's not the way it is anymore oh god yes you know we'd say jump they'd say hi well first of all you know if any south you know you know some south american country ending the truth embargo some country we tried to overthrow in some you know previous era that's going to be a little embarrassing for sure brazil though being the first nation uh would not be nearly as is consequential to the United States than, say, Russia or, or the People's Republic of China. I think it was Robert Bigelow not too long ago gave a presentation where he, he, he showed great concern that the People's Republic of China might be in a position pretty soon to claim the moon. Yeah, well, uh, again, it's not a conference. It is a hearing, citizen hearing. It's designed to look and feel like a congressional hearing. It's the hearing that Congress has not held. Uh, And it's been, uh, well, I guess since uh, 1968 was the last time that the Congress held a hearing uh, on this, which is amazing when you consider how much evidence is amassed since then. Um, And it's going to cost $600,000. That's how much we're spending on it. To give you, it's, it's the most expensive event in this field ever. It is the largest event, I think, of its kind ever. It's unprecedented in the nature of the way it's constructed. And more importantly, we're, we're, we're making it accessible to the media around the world. In other words, any, any reporter, editor, or publisher in any country in the world can, can watch this live for 30 hours for $3.80 by going to citizenhearing.org and clicking on the webcast, the CHD webcast. Now, the, you know, obviously the public as well, we, we'd love to have people all over the world watching this. this. This could be an historical event. This could be the event that triggers disclosure finally. Not directly, but by triggering the media to actually start asking, you know, who have access in every country to, to, their, to their leadership and to their legislatures and so forth. And if they're so disposed, could ask questions about this. Uh, And if that starts, it's over. The truth embargo cannot sustain even a a moderately vigorous uh, um, media uh, engagement of investigative investigative, uh, engagement. So uh, that's what's going down. Uh, And and it's not the only thing happening. There there are other documentaries coming out. There there's more documents being released. Australia just joined the the group of nations, uh, the last major Commonwealth nation, about a number of months ago, and Australia proactively released a lot of their files uh, on this phenomena. Not smoking gun, not gun camera footage. None of them have done that, but uh, they've released more files, be downloaded millions more times. People all over the world spreading this this information everywhere, while the U.S. of course has not released anything. Again, the U.S. is is boxed in. It can't take any action because as the leader of the truth embargo, any such action would be magnified, and and suddenly they'd have a thousand reporters on top of them. So they have to do nothing, right? Um, um, So our our, uh, goal is nothing less than creating a situation where the truth embargo will end this summer uh, and and to help ensure that they they don't think this is just going to go away. Not only are we holding the event from April 29 to uh, May the 3rd, but we are broadcasting it worldwide live. And then we're putting an archive up of the English, Spanish, and four other languages, hopefully Hindi, Mandarin, Japanese, and Arabic, representing a total of 3.5 billion people, and that'll be up for 30 days. And then we're making a documentary about it that'll come out later in the year. We're not going away. If they think they can just sit there and we'll all go away and try to forget this, it's not going to happen. They're going to have to do something. 
Stephen passed the, the you know the bulldog of getting the questions out. Sick of the uh, you know you you, you go get them. We like that attitude. We need more people with that kind of fire to get you know the answers to our questions because you know there are out there in the government high power trying to suppress technology that could benefit benefit mankind as a whole you know we, the video that we just got in from area 51 we asked him what what is why is he doing this what is his uh you know agenda and the whole thing and he just wants to know the answers where our taxpayer money is going and you know trying to find out do you know anybody in area 51 uh, base that has come forward through your research that has uh, spoken to you about number, Area 51 on what is really going on there? number of people have come forward about Area 51. There's probably a good dozen. Uh, that's It's a tough one because that they protect Area 51 pretty intensely, as you know, and so they've gone to greater lengths, I think, to undermine uh, potential witness testimony there. I think probably the leading expert on Area 51 and the witnesses is George Knapp. Uh, and, and uh, at this point, Area 51 is not – I mean, Area 51 is going to come up in the hearing. I really would love to do a strong panel about it, but I could not assemble the people I needed. It's tough. Uh, but we don't, we don't need Area 51. Everybody knows about it. Uh, perhaps in another hearing we'll do that. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, this, uh, this business about, you know, being a bulldog and all that. Uh, let me tell you a little anecdote here. We have six former members of Congress. 20-year congressman, Roscoe Bartlett, who's a scientist, served on many committees relevant to this issue, uh, and just left the, the House, right, after 20 years. We've got Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, who just left the House after serving 20 years. We have uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Kilpatrick, that left not too long ago after 14 years, Darlene Hooley after 12 years. Then we have another gentleman who is, is, is a scientific background, Merle Cook. And then we have Senator Mike Gravel. Now, you fellows may not be of our generation, my generation, or certainly Mike's generation, but you talk about a bulldog. Mike Gravel is still going strong in 82, still pretty sharp. And a lot of people have forgotten that it was Mike Gravel, in order to help short-circuit the Nixon administration's effort to to indict and convict Daniel Ellsberg over the release of the Pentagon files, as well as their lawsuits against the Washington Post, essentially irrevocably uh, put the issue out there by getting up and filibustering and reading the Pentagon papers into the record of his Senate committee on public works, I believe it was. It didn't matter. And by doing that, he basically made the whole issue moot and helped to, helped to result in the collapse of the case against Daniel Ellsberg. Now, that's a bulldog. And Mike Gravel is on the committee, this committee. And I'll give you another little antidote. You want to know about a bulldog? 44 year, 45 years ago, the last congressional hearing, which had five witnesses, it was basically kind of a just get the hearing done, here's some stuff, and then let's just forget about it. Right, 1968, and then the next year they closed down Project Blue Book and then tried to just pretend nothing, you know, it was all going to go away. One of the five and only living witness from that that hearing was Stanton Friedman, and 45 years later, Stanton Friedman is going to be testifying in front of the Citizen Hearing Committee. That's a bulldog. That's the kind of people that they think are just going to go away and leave them alone and it isn't going to happen the american people are so disgusted with american politics because of its degree of institutional lying and propaganda and ineffectiveness that the approval rating of the congress is at 10 percent 10 percent the politburo in the soviet union had better approval ratings than that they should be grotesquely embarrassed that in a country like ours, where you have a great deal of latitude to take action, and you're not going to be thrown in a gulag or put into prison because you, you challenge, say, one of the branches of government, that they are so ineffective that their approval rating is 10%. That's how bad it is. 
And so this idea that somehow if they just learn how to lie better or do even less and less and less, that somehow their approval rating will go up is madness. They had better start doing their job and telling the truth or – well, I, you know, they become irrelevant. I don't know. Maybe we'll just shut the whole thing down and we'll just have two branches of government. That, that's the reason why the citizen hearing on disclosure has a motto. And I assure you, this motto is not referring to any of the citizen committee members. But the motto is, if Congress will not do its job, the people will. We're going to do their job for them, and we're going to do it at the National Press Club, 14 blocks from when, where they don't do their job. And we're sending a simple message. My God, folks, we're paying $180,000 a year, and we have to do your job for you, too. And exactly. then we're sending the press a message which isn't doing their job. We're, 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 we're investigating this issue and we're holding the investigation in the National Press Club where the 13 floors underneath us are filled with media who are not doing the job that we're going to do for them. I don't know how clear this message could be. You know, one, one of the things you hear from, I don't know, the, the – um, I'm not sure. They're not really debunkers. They're sort of – Oh, defenders of the status quo, reactionaries perhaps, but they state, you know, the reason that they don't tell us, or they really shouldn't tell us about the truth about this is it will scare us, we'll become frightened. And I'm going, you know, you know what scares people? What scares people is when you tell them there's nothing going on at all, and then they see this stuff happening. Now that, the, the right. unknown, right, what is it? Well, the government doesn't know, won't even tell us. God knows what it is. So, the truth embargo was actually had exactly the opposite effect, and, and I don't believe for a second that Scaring us is in any way the reason why they haven't told us the truth. It, it is primarily a national security matter. Uh, it's also yeah. an economic matter with certain segments of, of the industries. But uh, most of this is just propaganda. You know, co uh, economy will collapse, not true. Re religion will collapse, not true. We'll be scared and frightened, not true. Uh, what, is, what is causing uh, the economy to collapse is lies about the banking in industry, lies about the economic systems, lies about the actions of criminals within these systems. Uh, what's causing uh, the uh, infrastructure to collapse is not is, is lies about the, the condition of our own bridges. Our esteem in the world is being caused to collapse by lies about our policies with respect to other nations, about uh, the reasons we go to war. Lies upon lies upon lies is destroying the United States' position in the world. We're, 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 we're hell-bent to become the British Empire of the 21st century, where you know we're reduced to like one one just sort of limited country, surrounded by nuclear weapons and some big ships, uh, you know, unable to pay our bills and uh, uh, increasingly irrelevant unless we want to launch a nuclear war or something. I mean, this is where we're headed. This is what they want, and so the truth embargo which at one time was a policy that perhaps was needed because of the fact that we were hell-bent on building tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and threatening to launch them at any moment, and they were deeply concerned that, that uh, the extraterrestrial issue would just be more than society could handle, that, that's, that, that's, that day has passed. And so the justification is no longer there, and so the truth embargo simply becomes another instance of massive lying, institutional lying, which is helping to undermine the, the virtual fundamental credibility of the United States, not only overseas, but in, in the country. You know, you know, you know we, we now live at a time when on any given day something's going to blow up. And one of the first questions that's going to be asked by people and by the media is, was it domestic or foreign? Well, that, that's, that, that, that's a great place to be, you know. America, the exceptional nation, the great nation, the world superpower. Basically, one of the decisions it has to decide every few days is, was the last explosion domestic or foreign? That's what it's come to. Now, anybody that doesn't see how bad that is and doesn't understand where we're ultimately going and doesn't realize we have to have major institutional reform is living an utter delusion and will be standing on the corpse of this nation in, in due course you know mr bassett we have preston dennett he's a mufon researcher of 23 mm -hmm. years oh, he's yeah. also been an author of 15 books two more coming out and he's just joined us on the show preston you have a question for mr bassett i sure do hi Stephen. we met i don't know hi, if you remember at david sarita's house yes i do remember mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a great uh, subject. I think this is the most important area, honestly, of uh, UFO research. And I'm wondering, what do you think is the best case scenario of this uh, citizens' disclosure meeting that we're... Best case scenario? 
Yeah. Um, the, the the hearing goes extremely well. We 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 we're hoping we're going to get. Uh, we'd love to get a few hundred thousand people on the webcast, which you can get by going to citizenhearing.org. And we're charging, I think, three dollars and eighty cents for thirty hours of of the hearing. And if we can do that, then we'll we'll have adequate funding to ensure the documentary about all this gets done this year. So that would be one part of the best case scenario. And then the second best, of course, would be a great deal of press coverage going in and during and after. And we're well on the way to that. It's looking pretty good, though recently some things blew up, as we all know, and that's attracted enormous press. And so we're, we're having to compete with the latest explosions, which we're not sure yet whether they're domestic or foreign. Um, and then, uh, th- th- then what happens then is that uh, some of the editors and publishers and, and, and some of the network owners finally realize that the biggest story of all time is right underneath their nose, and they start asking some questions. Uh, you know, in the White House briefing room, uh, at the uh, uh, the State Department briefing room, the Secretary, the, 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 the Department of Defense press conferences, uh, and also of various public figures that are attached to this issue, such as John Podesta, and Bill Richardson, and Webster Hubble, and of course Bill and Hillary Clinton. Uh, if they do that, then we've done our job, and I, I again, I think the truth embargo will end this summer. That's a that's that's the best case scenario, and it's not out of the question. I mean, it's definitely possible. Obviously, the more people that watch and listen and pay attention, uh, the better. Uh, but ultimately, the press is going to have to pull the trigger on this uh, because you know this is not the kind of issue you can put a million people in Washington marching up and down the street on. It's just not that kind of issue. That's not going to happen, and it cost a fortune to do that. Uh, this is the kind of issue that needs the media. Um, same thing with the Iraq War. Uh, the, the the situation developing on the Iraq War, which happened very quickly, was not the kind of issue that a bunch of people going into the street could have resolved. What was needed was the media. The media needed to get in there, dig, get in investigative mode, and sort out what was being said to us. And we might have gotten to the truth, and that war might have been avoided, but the media failed us. In fact, uh, I'll drive this point home by saying this. In, in the National Press Club, uh, not in the hallway where the main ballroom is, where we're going to hold a citizen hearing, but in the other hallway, which leads uh, to the restaurant, very nice restaurant, by the way, uh, is a plaque that was donated to the press club in 1962 in 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 in, um, in honor of the um, founding of the Columbia School of Journalism by Joseph Pulitzer. And this pl- plaque has a quote on it uh, from Joseph Pulitzer, of, of which the first sentence is rather profound. And that sentence reads simply this: "Our republic and its press will rise or fall together." And there's nothing, uh, no, nothing uh, truer out there than that. And the press needs to understand that. If the public goes down, the press goes down. And if the press goes down, the public goes down. They are wedded together. Uh, their fate is wedded together. That is the nature of relatively democratic states, Republican states, representative government. If the press just thinks they're, a, they're, they're, they're here to make a buck and, 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 and toss some tabloid stories around, then, then they're in the wrong profession. And they ought to do, I don't know, whatever they want to do, I don't know, start a reality show, open up a hamburger franchise, whatever. But for God's sakes, get out of journalism. The press in this country is essential to the, the, the to sustaining this country. And they've lost that. They don't get that anymore. And they think that uncovering a, an affair between a movie star and a, and a general or something in the army is massive investigative success. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. When the real stuff comes down, they are failing us over and over again. And so I'm going to call attention to that quote frequently during the citizen hearing. We got. We'll have. Well, I'm put, actually, I'm going to put a picture up of it on, uh, up on the uh, uh, the citizen hearing website tonight. Um, Citizenhearing.org, by the way. Uh, so you see what I'm saying? You, you see how this all ties together? This is sort of locked in together. There is a there is a Gordian knot that needs to be cut, and and the citizen hearing is a six hundred thousand dollar knife that we've sharpened as best we can to see if we can cut right through that knot. And now and we're freeing everybody up to then do the job that they, you know, were meant to do, paid to do, perhaps called to do. Yeah, I think people are very interested in UFOs. And I think overwhelmingly people, you know, believe in them, the majority certainly. But uh, on the same hand, they're just 
people aren't taking action and they're not thinking that this is an important issue. And I'm wondering what we can do to make people take this subject more seriously. And why pe- why aren't people more into UFOs? This is a huge story. Well, again, that's actually not the the way it is. The, the polls quite show that they're quite aware that this issue is real. And first of all, we don't want them to get into UFOs. We we want to we want to put the acronym UFO completely in the past. Right, right. It no longer works. It no longer applies. It's inappropriate. It's anachronistic. Let's just forget about it. It's extraterrestrial phenomena. That's what it is. It's not UFOs. UFOs is a, is a propaganda term created by the government specifically to help maintain the truth embargo. It's it's no longer applies. We're talking about extraterrestrial phenomena. We're talking about extraterrestrials. We're talking about silver discs with human, uh, humanoid non-humans in them. That's what we're talking about. If there's a flock of geese up there, fine. We're not talking about that. You know, the citizens hearing is the most important event that's taking place in decades, if not in all of ufology's history. The top members of the witnesses, military brass, uh, intelligence agents, the astronaut, you know, everybody's going to be testifying in front of former members of Congress. How much better can it get to push disclosure? Mr. Bassett, let's pick up where we left off. You know, we're going to be covering this. We're going to be watching the whole thing over those five days. And, you know, we're going to be releasing updates and hoping that the people are going to be watching and we're going to be pushing it. All you listeners out there, make sure you stream in and watch it live on citizenshearing.org. Yeah, I hope that they will uh, participate, right? Um, and uh, spread it. You know, we really hope people will spread the link, citizenhearing.org, and the webcast, uh, or the direct link to the webcast, uh, uh, through their social media, uh, Twitter and all that stuff. Let's get it out there and see if we can get broad participation. Uh, everybody wins if we, we, we do that. Uh, this event's importance, of course, remains to be seen. It, it is the potential to be historical. There's no question about it. It will not be perfect. I'm sure this is a very complex technical uh, setup that we're having to do. Uh, it was even more complex that we cut back because we were just overreaching. Uh, so we'll probably have some technical glitches and what have you. But in general, uh, we expect uh, we it to go fairly it. smoothly. You know, I, I think it will go very smooth because, you know, you have amassed such enormous witnesses The South American panel is going to be talking about, uh, you know, there was the crash in in Brazil as recently as 1996, and the government was there is very open about it. I think with all these different witnesses, I I don't know how much better it can get. What more do the people want? The evidence is right there. Uh, again, the people, I think, you know, again, the, the people by and large get it, and we don't, we don't really need to. It won't make much difference if we persuade another 5, 10, 15 percent. It's the media that has got to get turned on here. Now, admittedly, if the Congress were to watch this from up the street and go, wow, we really need to get on this and started holding some hearings themselves, uh, that would be fantastic as well. We'd love both the Congress and the media to to do their jobs. That would be great. I I can assure you, we could have, you know, if we had had the money, we could have put in 200 witnesses, 300 witnesses. uh, we're limited to 40 only because it, it, that's all we can afford to bring. Because uh, we're doing it right, we're not doing it on the cheap. And and uh, uh, but but it's it, don't. It, this is still a fraction. The, the evidence that'll be presented will still be a fraction of the evidence, which ultimately, in the co- in, in its collective sense, confirms an extraterrestrial presence from almost certainly another other planetary systems. Evidence that the U.S. Uh, I mean, the Department of uh, the Executive Branch of the United States government has stated in writing just 18 months ago, none of it exists. None of this that we're about to present exists. I don't know how starker you can get, right? Uh, so I'm hoping the media will go. Do we really want to sit on our hands when statements like that are coming from the most powerful uh, executive uh, of state? Because when, when, when the Office of Science Technology Policy wrote that, and, and again, if you go to disclosurepetition.org, uh, which is the, the home of the disclosure petitions we set up, you, you go to the first one, Disclosure Petition 1, and you can go to the White House website, and you can see the, the response. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, for, for the most powerful executive branch 
in the in the world to make a statement that completely false, and for the press to go, well, let's just give them that, or let's just not pretend you know they didn't say that or whatever. I mean, you 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 just can't do that and call yourself a journalist. I don't know what you are—a lackey, a government stooge, useful idiot. I don't know. Pick a phrase, but you're not a journalist. And so we're really trying to say, folks, you know. You can still be journalists. You can still do your job. And we're telling the same thing to Congress. You can still be legislators. You can be leaders. You can you can uh, gather facts and make good law. All of that is possible. All you have to do is start opening your eyes, paying attention, and tell the truth. And watch how fast your approval ratings go up. It's a simple message. Now, the reasons why they're not getting it yet, I suppose, are very complex, and a lot of people will write lots of books about that. But in its essence, it's it's really simple. It's a simple act. It's a decision. Instead of lying, you tell the truth. Instead of inaction, you do action. Instead of instead of guessing or speculating or, or working out of philosophies and ideologies, you work from facts, which is what hearings are about. They're fact-gathering, supposedly objective fact-gathering uh, processes that the Congress is supposed to use to make law, not, not, uh, not forums for grotesque political posturing on the part of partisan ideologues, right, which is what they use it for now. And the witnesses are almost irrelevant. They shouldn't even bring them. They should just hold a hearing with no witnesses and just have each member of the party get up and, and scream their ideology into the air. That's right. why the approval rating of Congress is 10%. So we're, we're trying to help them. We're not trying to bring them down. We're trying to help them up. Well, I think part of the problem here is with the whole UFO situation, it's so complex and this cover-up has got multiple levels in terms of, you know, there's... People who are ready to come out and testify about what they have seen, but there's also footage, and uh, then we have, of course, the whole crashed UFO scenario. And my question to you is, what aspect of our government, or who, who exactly do you think, or have you been able to find out, is covering this up, and why? And you know, Well, again, I don't call it a cover-up, call it a truth embargo. Right. Uh, it's thrill, not illegal, what they're doing. It's all national security, fully justified, under the law. So people that keep thinking eventually we're going to sue it out of them or we're going to take them to court and we're going to scare it out of them by threatening them with prison. Forget it. It's, it's legal. It's a truth embargo. It's not a cover-up. Um, the, we don't we – don't, we, well, they, they don't send out e- emails about how they're operating the, <laughs> the truth embargo. Uh, so we have to guess. Uh, but the best guess that I have is that this issue is managed by cross-agency committees. Uh, working in deep classification. Now, what do I mean by cross-agency committee? It's a very simple concept. Say, let, let's take an aspect of the ET issue. Let's say the technology. Right? And the ETs have some great technology, as we've learned from the crash vehicles we've obtained. Um, there are certain agencies of government where that is you know, pretty important. I mean, that you, know, you can imagine that. Certain, certain parts of the military and certain elements of the U.S. government would be very interested in that. And so, so it's very likely there's a committee in which there is a person representing each of those entities, government entities, that would be interested in the ET technology. And so they're, 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 so there's multiple agencies represented there, cross-agency committee. And it's very possible that the agency that they represent doesn't even know that they're representing. Are you following me here? All right. Sure. Right. But nevertheless, this committee can be very valuable. Each person brings a lot with them. They, 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 they know what's going on in their agency. They have knowledge. And so they can help manage the issue. And there may be another committee dealing with the, the truth embargo itself and another committee dealing with the biological aspect of this. There could be another committee dealing with contact. Right. And these committees collectively manage this issue. And it's possible that these committees, in some instances, don't even know who's on the other committees. But that's where we think, I believe, it's run. It's not run by uh, Exxon Oil or BP. It's, it's not run by the Illuminati. It's run by people working in the national security field, making good livings and good money, but not rich and not expecting to be rich. Mr. Bassett, you actually touched on something I wanted to ask you. When Roswell happened, obviously the U.S. Air Force was there. And then, of course, it took it to the highest levels of the government. MJ-12 was formed. You know, the president at the time, I don't think the president's in the loop now. Nonetheless, I am worried that over the last few decades that all this technology was actually funneled into private hands, private corporations 
who don't have to answer to the public. And I fear that that actually might be one of the big reasons to worry why we're not getting the truth. Do you, what do you have to say about that? I uh, don't see it quite that way. I, 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 I would not be surprised at all if some technologies garnished from crash vehicles or any other ET source that might have been helpful to our commercial technological development might have been introduced some way. I mean, this is what Corso was talking about, though it's not clear to what degree his work at the Foreign Technology Desk uh, you know, boosted our, our you know, economic advancement, technological advancement. It's not clear, but I, I wouldn't surprise me at all that they would do that. Now, obviously, uh, there are some technologies that probably couldn't even be introduced into the commercial world. Uh, again, we don't know all the details, but that's not the same thing as uh, they handed all the technology over to a bunch of corporations and said, we're not interested in it, but you all run with it and we'll, we'll, we'll never tell anybody it's ET. No way. Look, um, the the energy system that, the, that those craft use, which I do not believe is uh, – 97 octane gasoline uh, and the and the uh, propulsion system that they use which I, I don't think is like rotating blades uh, have enormous weapons capability and you can bet your bottom dollar that they've considered every conceivable way to weaponize that technology now there's there's a very good possibility that that other nations have got crash vehicles and one of the things that concerns me and i and i think others is that there may be a hidden et tech weapons et weapons technology uh race that's kind of been going on off to the side all these years where you've got more than one country trying to see if they can out weaponize uh the other countries who may also have crash vehicles or maybe not. Don't know. Maybe there's only one country with such crash vehicles. It's the U.S. Evidence seems to point, though, in another direction. So there's that, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, this this whole thing about governments create super, super secret re- weapons of tremendous power and then tell us after they use them. This is not a road we want to go down. I mean, we went down that road with the, the atomic bombs uh, on Japan and so forth. We get it. But to keep going down that road would be catastrophic, particularly when that road includes bioweapons. Because the technology we have gotten from extraterrestrials, I suspect, is more than just uh, propulsion systems and physics. Because the evidence is we have bodies. And that means we have biology, alien biology. So what are we doing there? We know that there's lots of, of, of web, you know, bioweapons labs, uh, most of which they don't talk about. God knows what they're doing there. And so, again, one of the problems of having a secret empire is not the, the just you have because you have one. It's what that empire does. And one of the things it does, which, which Hollywood loves to, to, to fictionalize, and, 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 and rightly so, because it's scary, and we need to constantly keep it in mind, is that they're weaponizing biology. And so, you know, all of this is happening without the Congress having the slightest idea what's going on, or increasingly the president. This, of course, is a recipe for disaster. And so, one of the 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 goals of the uh, disclosure movement is is to bring out the ET reality, and hopefully trigger a complete review of the entire secret empire, the way it's run, what it's doing, and bring it into line with uh, sensible, reasonable and hopefully sustainable policies with reasonable oversight. Yeah, or you know, eventually we're going to turn the planet into a, a dead, virus-ridden, or radioactive heap. I mean, it's not hard to figure that out. I mean, there isn't a person, I think, in the United States that they can't sort of tell you that. It's very possible now. And, and Hollywood tells us every single year with another movie, how many times do we have to be told we're going down a road that leads to a heap of dead Deadness. Right. Interestingly, that's exactly that's the number one message that abductees and contactees are being given by the ETs. And here's Very another true. question um, that I wanted to ask you. you know, this is not just a national movement. This is an international uh, movement, and I think that a lot of other countries are pretty 
much ahead of us. You know, Brazil and France re- releasing a lot of information. What do you think of the fact that we're kind of lagging behind and perhaps this disclosure will actually come from another country? Well, that's what I said earlier. I mean, the, 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 the U.S. has boxed itself into uh, two corners. I mean, the military is boxed in one corner. The, the executive branch is boxed in another. We're frozen. And because we pretty much run the truth embargo for all these years, we're even more constrained because any action we take – uh, has the potential to unravel the whole thing, and so they're they're clinging to this truth embargo. It's become like a it's become like Linus's blanket. They have to have it with them at all times. I mean, my guy, you take the truth blanket, they'll all the, away, away, uh, the truth embargo away from them. They will they will fall apart. Um, this is awkward, um, and I feel for them. But so what? Well, my feeling is if they don't take action, they're going to lose control of the whole situation. So well, it's to their benefit. They've lost control in a way, uh, but again, it's it's you know, ulti- in the long run, it's not going to matter. In the long, long run, uh, two, three, four, five hundred years, it's not going to matter whether Russia or China ends the truth embargo. In the short run, I think that there are significant implications to who ends the truth embargo first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, I generally lean toward the United States doing it. I think that. I think that it's in the best interest of the world for the U.S. to do it because the U.S. needs to regain the confidence of the world. I mean, we are the leading nuclear power capable of destroying every nation on Earth. Literally. I mean, the only reason we don't do that is because hopefully we don't want to and because there are there are other nuclear weapons out there. We would destroy ourselves. But, I mean, uh, that aside, we have the power to destroy every nation on Earth. I'm amused at all this action by North Korea. It's pretty funny. These poor, poor people led by such fools and idiots uh, that are rattling a saber. We could level North Korea, and there wouldn't be anything but microbes living there. We have that kind of power. Right? And so it's, 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 it's kind of important what people think of us, the trust they have in us, the, 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 the confidence they have, the esteem they hold us. And, and uh, we're not going to give those nuclear weapons up anytime soon. So I think our ending the truth embargo, being the leader here, will help to restore confidence in, in, in these other nations, in us, us with the, with the 20 some, I forget how many we got, 20,000 nuclear war weapons and, of course, massive navies and, and so forth. Uh, whereas if Russia does it, is that going to increase confidence in the United States? I don't think so. Right? And so, again, I think not, not just because I'm an American citizen and, and, and I'm being patriotic. Uh, I believe, literally believe, it is in the best interest of the world for the U.S. to correct this policy first. I do believe I, that. I, I agree, but I'm wondering, you know, if if we don't do it, nobody does it, what do you think of the possibilities of the ETs doing it? I mean, a la Phoenix Lights and things well, like that. it's this. always a possibility. Uh, and if that were to happen, I can assure you, uh, it will be, there will be consequences. You know, Mr. Uh, Bassett, I've actually been thinking or saying to, to Blake, with all this footage that we've been getting around the world, the third phase of the moon, literally almost 700 videos. It's over 670 right now. Mm-hmm. Some of them are such amazing shots, and you're never going to see them on media. And then we were talking about a Chicago case, and we mentioned O'Hare. And the reason O'Hare had to be covered is because it halted traffic. There sure. were so many witnesses. Those international flyers were going to go home to Romania, Brazil, wherever they were flying to, and we're going to talk about what happened. So the media had to cover it. Mm-hmm. But they're not covering these other little events, and yet they're just blowing it off. Like you said, the journalists are not doing their job. I don't know if it's because they're censored, I don't know if it's because they're told not to do so, or they're just plain stupid. But I really well, hope... Here's another way to look at it. Look, anybody under the age of 66 has lived every single day of their life under the truth embargo. Okay? Every single person under the age of six. So that's all they've known. And so don't be shocked if uh, uh, people are sort of hypnotized, not hypnotized, but just incul- incul- inculcated with this, 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 this whole status quo, and they just can't break out of it. I get it. Right? Um, however, this is the ultimate age of information. And so while... Yeah, I've lived the whole life under the truth embargo. Uh, I have access to a billion times more information on the Internet than you know, most of the human race prior to 1900. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So, so the information is there. 
Uh, and so the ability to, uh, obviously information is the antidote. The truth is the antidote to lies. It's the antidote to dysfunction. The truth is pretty much the antidote to most everything. Um, and so we do have the means to get at the truth if we choose to do so. So, uh, but under the truth embargo, it doesn't matter whether you have a hundred pieces of film or a hundred million pieces of film. It doesn't matter because none of them count under the truth embargo, right? That's why it's so effective. The truth embargo isn't based upon X number of pieces of evidence being denied and after which it collapses. It's under the concept of denying all evidence no matter how many. A billion people could come forward and testify. It wouldn't matter. That's why it's so ugly. That's why it's so wrong. That's why it violates practically, I consider, natural law. The Catholic Church tried to do this back uh, in the 1600s, 1500s, and of course it failed, but they did pull it off for a while, and it embarrassed the hell out of them. And of course, they eventually had to apologize. The, the U.S. government made the same mistake, but under much more difficult circumstances. The reasons that the U.S. government launched the truth embargo between 47 and 52 are a hell of a lot more justified than the reasons the Catholic Church decided that they want to contain the Copernican Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we'll, give, we'll give the government some points here. I, I get it. But it's 22 years now. It's time for this to end. Uh, we're not going to wait 200 years for the government to apologize, you know, after they finally told the truth. No. Right? So, it, it, it's a simple matter. Tell the truth, reap those rewards, continue to lie, pay the price. Real simple equation. You don't have to be a genius, right? You just do the math. And we're putting that math out there in front of them at the citizen hearing, as simple as we could. I'm sure there are people that will find things wrong with it, this witness, that witness, and they say, well, the thing is useless, whatever. You know, one of the things about truth embargoes is that it creates essentially its own defense. People are so confused and bamboozled and irritated and frustrated that they become the, their own worst enemy. Well, second worst enemy. The worst enemy is the government, of course. But uh, so there'll be plenty of that. But the fact is, is that the event, the citizen hearing, is going to be good enough, big enough to do the job, if uh, the press is prepared to to act on it. Um, but that remains to be seen. We'll see. Uh, we certainly hope that people will watch it. We hope that they will, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I think it'll be downloadable. Eventually, it'll be downloadable. I'm sure the archives will be downloadable. And, and again, and, and, well, but one way or another, after the archives are over, eventually this thing is going to be that um, parts of this hearing, pieces of this hearing, are going to be everywhere, all over YouTube. That's fine. That's okay. Expect that. And so we expect it to be seen all over the world and downloaded millions of times. And that's just the best we can do right now. And then we'll do the documentary. And but we're not the only. There's another movie coming out called Sirius. It, it, it has its premiere on April 22nd. It's loaded with witness testimony. Uh, there'll be more of that. And it's just going to keep coming and coming and coming. And so I just want to say to the administration, I empathize. I feel your pain. But it, you can't stop this tide from coming in. So either... You know, swim with it, put on your flotation pillows, whatever you got to do, but you cannot stop this time. All right. I hope everyone truly enjoyed our show. You could see much more information at Dr. J Radio Live, drjradiolive.com. And of course, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel where you could find exclusive YouTube videos and exclusive interviews that only you can see there. And of course, you could find everything on the website. Also, the only name you have to remember is Dr. J Radio Live, DRJ Radio Live, because that is the only name we use for everything. That's the name of the show. Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, Gmail, Google+, you name it, that's it. So just remember that, folks. And with that being said, this is Dr. J of Dr. J Radio Live. Signing off.